Welcome back to our continuing discussion with Mike Posner at the University of Oregon. Uh, in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about some of your current research into education and the application of cognitive neuroscience to education. So give us a little background on that. Well, my involvement really came in two ways. One is that uh, neuroimaging had given us some networks that seem to be related to attention. And uh, if you have networks that are related to attention, you'd like to know where they come from. How do they get organized? And that meant uh, working with children or even infants to try to understand the origins of the orienting network and most recently of the executive network. And uh, so about 10 years ago or so, together with my colleague Mary Rothbart, we started to look at the origins of these attentional networks and have traced most of them back to infancy and have in recent years been interested in how they get shaped by genes and environment. Some of the differences among people in particular networks are extremely important and interesting. I mean, we all have an executive network, but some have a more efficient one than other people. Now, how does that arise? That's a good question. <laughs> Partly, it arises genetically. I mean, we all have genes, we all have the same genes, but they come in different flavors or alleles. And uh, so particular genes can be different in different people, different types of genes, and they can produce different types of receptors or, transmitter, or, tra or transmitters. And um, interestingly enough, the attentional networks are dominated by a single neuromodulator. So for the executive network, it turns out to be dopamine. For the orienting network, it turns out to be acetylcholine. For the alerting network, norepinephrine. And uh, you can use this information to search for the genes that might account for individual differences in these networks. So for example, we looked at differences in particular dopamine receptors and looked to see if they were related in adults first to individual differences in their ability to carry out conflict tasks which involve the executive network. And we found that they were and that these differences when you put the person into a scanner were manifest in areas of the executive attention network like the anterior cingulate gyrus. So uh, we knew that these genes must play a role in shaping these particular networks. And so we've studied infants and young children, tracing back the origins of the executive attention network. It turned out to be a total surprise. Both my colleague Mary Rothbard and I thought that we would probably not see much about executive attention until about three or four years of age because um, parents, if you ask them about their ability of their children to control themselves, they can answer for a three-year-old or a four-year-old, and certainly older, but infants, they don't control themselves, you control them. So if they need to be soothed, you soothe them, and so on. So uh, the questionnaires usually don't start till about age three or four, and the tasks that we had developed to study the executive network uh, they required pressing keys to instructions, and you can't do that in an infant. So uh, fortunately, with the help of our colleague Andrea Berger in Israel, um, we were able to show that one of the most powerful functions of the executive network was available, which is the detection of error. So you show something that's in error. Infants, it was known, look longer at errors and they do it correct, things that they expect. And uh, we found that the network involved, the area of the brain involved, was exactly the same anterior cingulate gyrus in infancy as it is in adults. So we were able to kind of trace the origins of this network back to infancy. And that has a lot to do with the new way of thinking about the brain and education. Because we now know, I guess we should have suspected all along, but we now know that very important 
quote, school learning or learning of things which will be important in school later goes back all the way to infancy. So for example, in the work of Pat Cool, she shows both that infants come into the world with the ability to discriminate all of the world's phonemes, but even before they begin to speak, their phonemic structure, their ability to hear the constituents of the language is being shaped by the speech community. So they are getting better discrimination in, in phonemes which are important in their language, in this society, English, mm -hmm. and losing the ability to discriminate, let's say, Mandarin. And Pat Cool also showed that with an appropriate tutor, you could maintain that phonemic structure. Well, this is very important because phonemic structure, the ability to discriminate phonemes, is the key ingredient in, le in the initial decoding that's necessary in learning to read an alphabetic language like English. So children that have trouble with getting at the phonemic structure, so-called phonemic awareness, they have trouble learning to read. And that problem goes all the way back to infancy when these are being shaped. And um, Andrea Berger showed the same thing is true in number. You might think, well, an infant can't do arithmetic. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, Karen Wynn at Yale University showed infants very simple arithmetic problems. And the way she did it was like this. Yeah, it seems, at first it seems impossible, but she would show them two puppets and then a hand would reach behind a screen and add another puppet. Then the screen would come up and there'd only be one puppet or there might be three puppets. Well, three would be correct if the one was added. And uh, the infant looked longer at the error trials than at the correct trials. In other words, real limits. I mean, they could only go up to three or four, maybe five. They couldn't go beyond that. But as early as seven months, they were discriminating between the correct mathematical solutions and the incorrect ones. And then Andrea Berger came along and showed that the system that was making that error detection was in the anterior cingulate gyrus, the same place as in adults. So again, the beginning of number, the beginning of sensitivity to number is present even in infancy. Well, this uh, finding, these findings that I've outlined for you for number, for literacy, or, or at least for phonemic awareness and for, and for attention, show that the importance of the early development of the infant brain, usually and not by teachers in school, but usually by parenting. And uh, now, uh, as some, of you, some of you probably will maybe be aware that there has been a very big project not based on details of this information, but based on the general idea of important infancy uh, developments in learning and the uh, uh, Harlem Children's Zone in New York City, where very low uh, socioeconomic status families were at risk for failure in things like learning to read, doing number, and so on. And um, uh, Jeffrey Canada and his associates developed a parent academy to try to tell parents about the importance of the brain's activity in these early years. And uh, at least from some preliminary reports that I've read, there have been really very huge changes that has occurred as a result of these early interventions. So much so that in one report I saw just in the New York Times by David Brooks reporting on this, that the usual gap between uh, very low socioeconomic and high socioeconomic status in arithmetic was wiped out. And this just from training parents. This is from train. training parents in interaction with their children. Of course, Canada is also developing elementary and so on to continue. Because, of course, you don't want to train a person and then leave them without any instruction in reading. You've got to begin a good instruction in reading because phonemic awareness isn't, isn't enough. But I think uh, neuroimaging has also provided 
a real important analysis as to how to go about teaching reading. For you know, for years there have been educational controversies about whether you wanted to use phonics, teach people about the phonemes of the language and how to do this and, and sound out things and so on, or whether you wanted to have uh, flashcards where people would get the whole word and so on. Well, it turns out there are two important posterior areas of the brain that are crucial to reading. One of them is uh, uh, near the boundary of the temporal, occipital, and parietal lobes, and is pretty clearly an area for phonemes. And uh, it is very active when one begins the decoding process. But there's another area, which is in the fusiform gyrus in the occipital lobe, not the primary visual area, but a secondary visual area, that is also crucial for fluent reading. It's called the visual word form area. So this area chunks letters into a single unit. So when you read, you don't really pay attention to the individual letters, as you, as you well know. This is why proofreading is so hard, because if you're familiar with words, you kind of miss the fact that they're misspelled. And um, this area begins to develop rather late. We don't know all the best ways to develop it, but it, most children it probably develops by reading itself. They can decode, so they can sound out the words, and as they get more and more familiar with them, they build an area of the posterior brain, this visual word form area, which allows them to read much more fluently. Can't you say you think that that's influenced more by the, uh, the genetics, or do you think it's more this experience of reading that, that helps that develop fast? A very good question, but uh, definitely the wrong way to look at it. Okay. It's a synthesis of genes and experience. Uh, and uh, probably for almost all children, regardless of what their genetic background is, and a good, a good, strong reading program can succeed. This is the good news. <laughs> that it probably, it, but of course there are differences in efficiency, and it's much easier for some children. And so the teacher, as I think many teachers are, has to be sensitive. So if the child is moving very fast, uh, you don't want to keep them kind of dealing with phonics and saying the words and so on, or dealing with very simple visual words, because what you really want them to do is keep them reading, which you have to have something interesting. So you have to adapt your program to the individual. That's not news for most teachers. But I think understanding how the brain partials out the task of reading into different kind of computational problems gives us a very much deeper and richer understanding. And it's going to be up to teachers, as always is, to adapt this understanding to the individual circumstances and so on. Right. So how have you applied some of your current research to any different programs or um, developing any sort of teaching tools? Um, this is a good question, and we, we have tried to do this with preschool attention. Our basic idea was that since the executive attention network is related to self-regulation, and since self-regulation is so crucial to all human interaction and learning, uh, it would be important to achieve a certain level of this even prior to beginning school. Some children will already have that level others may not be uh, that efficient. And so we tried to develop some programs that might help teach this. We took some programs that had been used to train monkeys to do NASA experiments. My colleague Mary Rothbard observed that the monkeys in the end were doing something like the Stroop effect. That is, they were taught to appreciate the quantity of a number so if they saw a digit three, they were given three pellets or three rewards. If they saw a seven, they were given seven. Then you can teach them to move, and they used a joystick, and so did we, to move the joystick to the larger of two arrays. So if you have five apples over here and two apples, they go to the five one, so on. But now suppose you make the five apples five representations of the digit three and the let's say three apples over here, the digit seven, now you have a Stroop effect. And monkeys, like human beings, are 
uh, slower when they have to deal with uh, uh, the conflict between the value of the number and the quantity that's present. And uh, so we adapted that to work with uh, young children. We use four, five, and six-year-olds because uh, this is a time when the executive attention network is developing very rapidly. We thought it would be a crucial time. And um, uh, we developed a five-day training, just five days, because it was just a demonstration. It wasn't to say that this should actually be used in the schools in this way. We just wanted to see and we were able to show that we could get improvements in performance, that it did change the network as measured by uh, scalp electrodes uh, localized to the anterior cingulate, and uh, it did generalize so that the children who uh, were trained with this also showed improvements in aspects of intelligence which were totally unrelated to the actual training that we did. So uh, we uh, got this program, and there are several other demonstrations, uh, especially in classroom situations, one using a curriculum called Tools of the Mind uh, that show that you can train attention uh, at this age, and uh, we don't yet know whether it has powerful influences, uh, but I suspect like the work of uh, the Harlem Children's Zone it will turn out that this also will have uh, important influences on the child's uh, progress in school, but that remains to be seen. Right. And these little demonstrations, are these effects just recorded right after the fact, or have you shown any longitudinal studies that show that this is a continuing uh, There ha fortunately haven't been any s real longitudinal studies. However, my colleague Charo Ueda in Spain uh, followed up after two months so at least two months delay, and she showed the effects remained present uh, after two months. Uh, what we really need to do is to be able to follow children into school and observe, and we're working on that right now, and I'm sure other groups, especially those studying classroom situations, will be able to do that, and we'll be able to see whether there's a long-term long -term benefit. All right, so that's sort of like, your ideal goal in the future is to be able to get into classrooms and see if this is really Well, it's not care. really my goal, but it, I hope that's done. I don't think this is exactly what we'll do because uh, we don't really have the resources ah. to carry out such a big study. But uh, once the ideas are present, then I think people will carry out the studies. And uh, you're right, we need longitudinal studies. The, the evaluation of the of the Harlem Children's Zone, that was a longitudinal study and seemed to show big effects even later. Many uh, longitudinal studies have shown that the specific benefits, let's say in reading, may go away later on, but there are some general benefits that seem like from uh, Head Start that seem present even much later on, and they may relate to the training of the Executive Attention Network. So as we're talking about education, of course, we're still talking about educators as well. So would you recommend that educators in, this, in these programs get experience in neuroscience to understand the way that the children's brains are developing and, and whatnot um, to help facilitate these programs? Yes, I think uh, knowledge about the influence of teaching on the brain, and that's sort of somewhat cognitive science, somewhat cognitive neuroscience, perhaps in some cases Pure neuroscience is important. I think that's going to be very useful for the design of educational materials by teachers. And in my experience is that it's not really hard to get teachers interested in this. And of course, it's still a very difficult art form to take information that you might get from studies of various sorts and actually be able to use it effectively in a, in a educational setting. But like every application of science, the application itself is, is an important creative thing, as well as the information that you get from the science. Well, thanks a lot for telling us about your, your research into education and how it might be applied to, uh, to real life settings. It's interesting to sort of find out how all this sort of academic cognitive neuroscience can be applied in the real world settings and really have a strong effect. Uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.